Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily Couple weeks and I'd go crazy, crazy Yeah, I need you on the regular, the regular Yeah, I need you, yeah, I'm telling ya, I'm telling ya Yeah, I need you on the daily Welcome to Divas with Debbie. So today is so filled with action. So let's jump right in. I know this is going to be a longer video. So um, today looking at Joshua 4 to 6. Uh, first off we have a commemoration after the Israelites cross over the Jordan led by Joshua. Um, God commands them to take one man from each tribe. There are 12 tribes and they each grab a big stone and they put it down all together. And those stones are to commemorate what God has done with them passing through like their, their whole history, wandering through the wilderness, and now passing through the Jordan on dry ground. And it's interesting because twice God mentions, like, okay, so this is so that when your children ask you, like, what are those rocks over there? You can actually share that. Israel passed over the Jordan on dry ground. And one thought I had with this is like the commemoration as an opportunity to share God's faithfulness and his power. And first off, like what am I doing to commemorate what God has done in my life in a way so that I can point to it and in front of other people and God can be glorified. So many thought there. Then... This is interesting. It's all not only just for the children of Israel to ask and see God's goodness, but uh, Joshua 4.24 says, So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Like ultimately, all of God's working in Israel is so that all the nations of the world will see who God is. Like that's the end goal. And like glorify him. We need to remember that. Even in the Old Testament, God is about drawing people to himself. God's still about making himself known to all peoples. He's just specifically chosen the people of Israel to fully reveal himself and to work through them, uh, to, to sanctify them and such. So chapter 5 is interesting because we see um, kind of a re-establishment of the uh, people of Israel. You know, they've come through the wilderness. They're finally about to win. And right before they're going into battle, God does something interesting in that he asks for all of the men to be circumcised. And here we sort of see a glimpse of Israel's disobedience, even in the wilderness, that as they were wandering around, from one generation to another, they didn't pass down the ways of God, like the ways God had asked them to live. Uh, so I feel like, one, it's like a fresh start for the Israelites. Two, it's like a mark of the nation, especially as they enter into other nations. They're not just wandering in the wilderness now. They are establishing themselves in the promised land, and they need to establish themselves as physically and all otherwise <laughs> different than the people they're, they're living around to remember they are set apart for God. But also I feel like this is a test of obedience because they've seen God's incredible, like miraculous sign as they cross through the wilderness and they cross through the Jordan River. But do they actually trust God enough to go through pain and suffering? <laughs> you know, to do what he asked them, like to obey no matter what. And they do. They obey God. And um, it's at this pivotal point uh, before they go into the promised land that they stop having manna from heaven. And they celebrate the first Passover in Canaan. And they begin to eat of the fruit of the land that year. Um, so again, a mark of a new time a new season and this is so cool I already forgot about this but Joshua's like by Jericho the city that they're about to conquer 
and he lifts up his eyes and he sees a man standing before him with a sword in his hand. And Joshua goes up to him and he's like, are you for us or for Jericho? And the, the man says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And one interesting thing is, he says, are you for us or for our adversaries? And this would be worth investigating, but the guy answers no. He doesn't say he's for his, for them or for the adversaries. He's like something completely different. He is the commander of the Lord's army. Um, and he's calm. And Joshua like falls on his face and he says, take off your sandals. Like this is holy ground. Just like when Moses was asked to take off his sandals with the birdie bush. So, wow. Like God is clearly reminding Joshua in this moment that God is for Joshua. Like, God is with Joshua. He is fighting for Joshua. And Joshua has a tremendous amount of responsibility on his shoulders right now. Probably a lot of fear. But time and time again, God is, like, reassuring him. Like, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm going to give you favor. And I'm fighting. I'm, like, going before you. Ah, oh, so cool. Um... Oof, and it just reminds you there's this spiritual dimension here going on too. This isn't just like a battle of the physical. There's some, there's spiritual, like, there's a spiritual component here, which often in this day and age where secularism is so high and science and everything and the physical, but we forget that there's a spiritual component to all of this too. Um... So, yeah, this is all before they actually go into battle. And the way that they battle is very interesting. So Jericho has been shut up, and Israelites are on the outside. And the way that God says that they're going to beat this city is for six days, they're going to march once around the city with all the men of war. So women and children and I'm thinking are held back and then on the seventh day they're gonna march seven times around the city and blow the trumpets and the last one the walls will fall down after they like shout and oh yeah along with them they have seven priests with seven trumpets and they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant Really interesting battle plan. Very interesting. So they do it. And incredibly enough, the walls come down that seventh day after seven times. And the priests blow their trumpets. And the only person and family and household that saved during this whole time is Rahab, the woman who hid the spies. And they, the spies people who were the spies go and they get her and all of her belongings and they separate her and like save her essentially um but one interesting thing is that she is a prostitute um and I forgot to check this but I'm pretty sure she's in the line of uh Jesus right um let's just double check um I may not be able to find this I should have double checked that Oh, yes? Okay. The Father of Boaz by Rahab. Um, Matthew 1, 5. So, wow. God adds a woman who's a prostitute, who's not even originally an Israelite, who's a member of Jericho, into the line of, like, the family of God. So, redemption with God is always there. Um, okay, let's jump into... Oh, yeah, that's so exciting. And it says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. So like God is just favoring Joshua and the people of Israel right now. Oh, and another key thing is they destroy everything that's in the city. Except for like gold and silver, which they put in like the treasury of the Lord. But everything goes. And this is an important moment, another test for Israelites because in the past, when they have been told by God to destroy everything in a city so they're not tempted to worship idols or anything or to live that kind of lifestyle, they have failed. 
so this is a test and it passed. Um, let's jump into Luke chapter 22. Again, this is packed with action. Um, so we hear of the plot to kill Jesus. And uh, Judas now is set up to betray Jesus. And one kind of scary component of this is um, in Luke 22, verse 3, it says, Satan entered into Judas. And I think when I was little and I read this, I, like, freaked out. Um, but I, I now know, like, we give permission for the enemy to enter us. We give invitation. Like, Judas didn't just, or Ju Satan didn't enter Judas without permission. Um, so Satan entered Judas, and Judas agrees to betray Jesus. And next we have this Passover that happens, and you notice how sweet and how um, meaningful this is for Jesus. Again, the disciples aren't always understanding what's happening, the gravity of situations, but Jesus does. And he takes this time so sincerely, he says, in verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Um, and he knows, Jesus knows, like, this is his time to be given over. <laughs> it's, it's almost here. And this is when the, uh, the, this Last Supper is when a new tradition has been established now. He says, Jesus says, like, breaking the bread. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wow. Jesus is saying explicitly, he is this new covenant, and he will give his body, pour out his blood. I mean, it's a little graphic, but it's also a new tradition has been established. He's saying, do this and remember it to me. Like, remember the sacrifice, just like the Passover, you know, is a commemoration of God and the angel of death, like, passing over the Israelites because of the covenant that God made with the Israelites and the blood that they spread over the door of the of a unblemished lamb. Like the parallels, you can't write this story. Like only God can. And now the new covenant is that the angel of death will pass over the people of God because of the blood of the new covenant of the unblemished blemished lamb of God who sacrificed himself so that we could be saved. Like, whew. So, even after he establishes this, right after, he says, like, someone at this table is going to betray me. And I think that's what starts out this new argument. So, they're all like, is it me? Is it you? And as they're disputing, a question comes up of, like, who's the greatest? And this sounds so ridiculous, but you also just realize these are humans, just like us. And they're all arguing over who's the greatest, not even knowing that that evening, Jesus is going to be arrested. Like, this is so intense. And they're just not understanding. They're not treasuring the moment with Jesus. It's kind of like when you set up something, you have expectations, it's going to go so, like you made something so special. And it just gets ruined because people don't get it. Same thing. Like, Jesus is like, are you serious? Like, this is supposed to be a special meal where we're all together. Um, but this is what Jesus says to, like, their argument about who's the greatest. Like, first, he says, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. You know, and he affirms that they're all, like, chosen. They're all at this table feasting with him and even in the end like they're going to sit with him and says like that you may eat and drink at the table 
in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Obviously, the, the disciples right now are still thinking like Jesus is the Messiah on here, like on earth. And God is, like Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. Like they're going to be rewarded in the kingdom of heaven and not here. Like if they, they need to be servants. So, sorry. Yeah, they're having this ridiculous argument. And then he turns to Peter and he says something quite shocking. He says, Simon, Simon, behold. Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Like, again, we see this other spiritual component, this spiritual dimension that's happening right now. Satan wants to sift Peter. He just wants to just sift him till there's nothing left. And Jesus intercedes for Peter, saying, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And he knows any and, and that you when you've turned again will strengthen your brothers. Like Peter, we've seen him time and time again. He's sort of quick on his feet and does things makes decisions that aren't always the best, um, says things without thinking, but Jesus is going to transform him, and Peter's going to become a bedrock of the church, you know, he says he's going to give him the keys to the kingdom, like, woo. so here we see a foretaste of that, but also a reality that they're, the enemy wants Peter, just like the enemy once wanted Judah, Judas. Um, so, yeah, Jesus reminds them that, like, this has to happen, and that they're not going to lack anything, but this is war. You know, he says, like, we need swords. And first you think, like, okay, whoa, like, Jesus is asking them to get swords, you know, to sell their cloak if they don't have a sword. Um, but just later, we see what he actually means by this, potentially. Um. But before we get there, he they go to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus, like, separates. And he says to them, like, okay, pray that you may not enter temptation. And he withdraws from them. And Jesus is praying with such intensity. He's in such agony. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The ultimate, like, surrendering to God's will. We need to model after this our own lives, our own surrendering. And, yeah, it says, being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And he returns to his disciples, and they're sleeping. And he says, like, wake up. Like, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray so that you may not enter temptation. Again, just like the Lord's Supper now here, the Israelites just aren't understanding what's happening here. Like, this is so, this moment is so intense. And Jesus is feeling this so deeply. I mean, it must have been so challenging for him to pray, you know, not my will, but yours be done. Um, and so Jesus, like Judas comes up to him. And he kisses Jesus to betray him. That's like his sign to the people that he had come with to arrest Jesus. Like he kisses Jesus. And Jesus says, Judas, would you have betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss? And sort of chaos breaks out a little. And one of the disciples, maybe, maybe Peter, uh, cuts off the right ear of one of the, of the high priests. Well, a servant of the high priest. And Jesus says, like, wait, 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 stop, none of this. And he picks up the ear, and he heals the man. He puts back the ear. And so we see, like, these swords aren't for fighting. Like, Jesus' kingdom, he's already reminding them and modeling to his disciples right in front of them that his way of conquering is not like they've 
they were thinking. It's not a conquest with swords and killing. Um, it's going to look really different. Um, yes, and so this whole... Um, everything goes down so quickly. You know, this is in the middle of the night. This is all done in darkness. Uh, Peter, like, follows behind as they take Jesus off, and he sits down at a distance and um, denies Jesus three times in front of people. His servant girl's like, what thing, what thing? And they're like, no. And then three times he denies Jesus, just like Jesus had said before. And after he denies Jesus three times, it says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter goes and he just weeps bitterly. So basically at this moment, Jesus is quite alone. He does not have his disciples with him. And it's an unjust trial right now. And he's before, <clears throat> you know, uh, before even that happens, they're like mocking Jesus and they're like blindfolding him, striking him, saying like, perhaps that, like, who struck you? Um, there's this horrible image. Um, they don't know what they're doing. They have no clue. And in, in the daytime, Jesus is brought before the council and all these people. And they're basically saying, if you're the Christ, tell us. And Jesus says like, if I tell you, you won't believe. Um, and if I ask you if I'm the Christ, you will not answer. And they all say, like, are you the son of God then? And he says, you say that I am. And that was it. They knew. I mean, the religious terminology that Jesus is using, they're like, he just claimed to be God. He just claimed to be the Messiah. That's it. Um, so super intense. Oh no, this is going to be a really, really long video. Um, finally, let's jump to 2 Corinthians 6, um, which is so filled with uh, relevant language to this moment. You know, Jesus is saying that his servants are not greater than, his master, than the master. And Jesus is suffering so intensely right now. You know, he was even before he entered his suffering, he's like, God, like, take this cup from me. Like, I do not want to experience this kind of suffering, but I will surrender to you, your will. And Paul is outlining here in his letter to the Corinthians, like, the kind of stuff that the people of God are going to face. And he says, as servants of God, again, the identity of a servant of God, we commend ourselves in every way. And I'm going to read this list just just because it's so powerful. He says, By great endurance, in afflictions, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet are true, as unknown, and yet well-known, as dying, and yet behold we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. <laughs> okay, so this is so packed, I don't have time to unfold it. But we see the cost of following Christ is intense. And, and we shouldn't expect anything less um, or complain. But we also see these, this dichotomy or, I don't know, these somewhat contradictory, contradictory terms, you know, saying we're treated as imposters, yet true. As unknown, like on this earth, we're not going to have some sort of fame or anything, you know. Yet, we are fully known by the Lord as dying, you know. And yet, eternal life. As punished. 
and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich spiritually, and as having nothing, but having everything in the Lord. Um, and then he also makes this important comment, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And this isn't saying don't, don't spend time with unbelievers or anything. It's really about, like, yoking. Like, who you are going to yoke with. Like, work closely with. Track together in life. Like, so marriage. And I believe, too, like, your closest friends, too. Like, don't marry an unbeliever. Because... unequally yoked like uh, an ox with a donkey or something it's just not going to work as you try to plow the field like there's going to be a difference in pace difference in strength one pulling further one not one trying to one with longer stride one with smaller stride it's just going to be the ultimate frustration um, and one of the reasons he says this is like why don't be unequally yoked is because we are a temple of the living God. Like, you bear the presence of God. So yoke yourself with someone who also has the presence of God. And the beauty of this next passage, this next chunk, is that um, God says, like, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. So, God is really asking us to be holy, to be set apart, because he has made his presence dwell with us. You know, one of the names that they talked about with Jesus is like, Emmanuel, like God with us. And here we see that very explicitly, God with us. And with the Holy Spirit especially dwelling in us. Like, God is in us. We need to yoke ourselves with believers and live as holy, like, set ourselves apart because we are children of God. Okay, that's too much. Bye.